I'm Amy Lee of Evanescence. Music Life is a show where four artists from around the world get together to discuss all aspects. Welcome to the Music Life podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Amy Lee of Evanescence. Music Life is a show where four artists from around the world get together to discuss all aspects of our lives in music. A new podcast episode is released every Friday, ahead of being broadcast on the World Service on Saturdays and Sundays. So rate and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find loads of other great episodes at the website, featuring the likes of Adrian Young, Gregory Porter, St. Vincent, Ali Shaheed Muhammad, Guy Garvey, David Byrne, Alex Isley, Agnes Obel, and Sin Kane, plus lots of great playlists to listen to. Head to bbcworldservice.com forward slash music life. Today I'm joined by Ice T, Ollie Sykes, and Aurora. We'll be talking about working through creative differences, using songwriting as a tool for personal growth, how we've changed since our first record, and whatever else comes up. Let's get into it. Hi, everybody. If you can hear me. Nice Hi. <laughs> can you? You can hear me. Hello. All right. Hi. Yeah, hey. I can hear everybody, I think. Okay. Yeah, let me just start by saying hi. I am so honored to have all you guys on one call. This is super cool. I'm Amy Lee, singer, songwriter, pianist, and lead vocalist of the rock band Evanescence. I've been doing this thing pretty much my whole life. Uh, I started the band when I was in high school, and we've been able to play for people around the world for the last about 20 years. It's incredible to say that. We just released our fourth full studio album, The Bitter Truth, and that is coming after our first debut album, Fallen, in 2003, then The Open Door, our self-titled Evanescence. We've gotten to do a lot of really cool things, including play with full orchestra with our Synthesis project in 2017, collaborate with really amazing artists, including two of which we'll have on the show today. Joining me today is a legendary Grammy Award winning American rapper, songwriter, producer and actor. After dropping his debut album, Rhyme Pays, in 1987, he founded the record label Rhyme Syndicate Records and has since released 14 studio albums, including seven with metal band Body Count. I had the pleasure of contributing some vocals to their song, When I'm Gone, on their album Carnivore. It's Ice-T. How are you? Hi, what's up, Amy? Um, I'm at home in uh, New Jersey. It's a great moment to really see you and talk to you after you gave us uh, that blessing on that last record. So we'll it really talk about is. that, I'm sure. Yeah it's, yeah, it's awesome to finally meet you face to face, even up. though it's over a screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, a British singer-songwriter best known for his crushing vocals in the band Bring Me the Horizon. Since forming in 2004, the band has released six studio albums and earned two Grammy nominations. He's also collaborated with artists ranging from Yumi at Six, Architects, Baby Metal, Young Blood, Nova Twins, and even me on the single One Day the Only Butterflies Left Will Be in Your Chest As You March Towards Your Death from their 2020 EP, Post Human Survival Horror. It's Ollie Sykes. Hey, Ollie, how's it going? Where are you at? All right, how's it going? Cheers for having me. I'm in, in Brazil at the moment. Ooh, nice. Mm. Jealous of that. That's awesome. Mm. And completing the show is Norwegian singer, songwriter, and producer whose music blends folk, electro, and art pop sounds. She's released two studio albums, and this year she's celebrating the six-year anniversary of her breakthrough single, Runaway, by releasing a series of specially curated EPs. I first heard heard her music um, when I saw a music video. I think it was the one for Queendom. And uh, I was really inspired not only by the sound, but by the visuals. Her fashion, everything about the look was really intriguing to me. It's Aurora. Hi, Aurora. Nice to kind of meet you. I listen to your music all the time. I'm a big fan. You do? Yes, I do. It's so nice. Wow, thank you. It's awesome. Thank you so much for being here. How are you? Where are you? Thank you so much for having me. I am uh, at home in Bergen in Norway. I'm enjoying my coffee and life is good. So I guess uh, we're just here to talk about music. Like what got you into it in the first place? When I was a kid in high school, it was really me in the middle of the night before having to do the stuff I was supposed to be doing, going to school in the morning feeling like I could be my true self in a place, getting a lot of the things out that were too hard to say. And that's what eventually led me all the way here. What got you into music, Ice? Well, I I never thought I could be in music because I can't sing and um, I can't play any instrument. 
I loved music. I grew up listening to James Brown and Parliament Funkadelic and all that kind of stuff. And I loved to dance. But uh, when hip hop came along and I heard rap, I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. I just said, how do they do that? How do they just say the words and keep talking and keep <laughs> talking? But I figured I could do that. I could do that. And then once I started doing it and uh, getting a little like respect and a little juice, yeah. Once you find something that you can be special at, you don't stop. You don't stop. So I was just like, yo, this is my thing. And uh, people liked it. And then I finally learned that I could not only just do music about parties and fun, but I could do topic driven music. Totally. I kind of find myself. And then as far as doing rock, I didn't think I could sing. But then I looked at rock and I'm like, who could sing besides you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, yo, you know, I'm listening to all the like the heavier metal stuff. And I'm like, especially New York hardcore, which right. was kind of like barking lyrics, you mm-hmm. know. And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, that's kind of like rap. You know, right. they're not really carrying a note, so to speak. And I said, I could do that, too. So I found my niche. That's the key to music, finding what you can do. Absolutely. You're an innovator. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ollie? I mean, for me, like music wasn't like a big part of my life until I was about 13. And before that, I never really had like a real sense of identity. It wasn't until my parents first got cable at home and like I went on Krang TV and I was like Linkin Park and Evanescence and all 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 these rock bands. And I was like, what the hell is this? Because I was, I've, I've got ADHD, so... I've always felt like a caged animal growing up and stuff. And then I was seeing all these artists and people on stage or, you know, in music videos, and they were, like, losing their minds, just going crazy, screaming, rolling around on the floor. I remember the first time I saw, like, Glassjaw, and I was just like, man, that is what I want to do. So (laughs) it was kind of been my life since then. How about you, Aurora? What got you started into it? Well, I think I just um, started doing it um, because... It was the only thing that kind of made sense in this very strange world. I didn't really like school either. I hated it because I didn't really fit in in the sitting still all day uh, box. <laughs> and I find it really hard to focus on things. So it was really nice for me to have this really safe space in music where I felt like I, I had a reason for existing. It just makes me feel calm in my own existence. Yeah, like understood. Kind of, huh? Yes. You can make yes. your own world, one that works, one that makes sense. Yes. It's beautiful. We just released our new album, The Bitter Truth, and uh, one of the songs Yay. on it. Yay! I know, I'm so happy. It's finally out. <laughs> um, it's great. Congratulations. Thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, God, that means so much. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the songs on it is called Yeah, Right. Yeah. I wrote that song back in 2010. Really? I did. It was completely different. I mean, it was so different in the sound than it is now. And I was going through a time back then I was writing for our self-titled album, um, but I didn't know what it was yet. I was going through a time in writing where I didn't really know what I wanted. I like to write from a free place without a plan. I didn't know if it was for Evanescence or even really what I wanted. I just really believed in it. We were making an Evanescence album and it was just this other thing. And I remember um, bringing it to the band being like, I know that we can make this great somehow. Like it's a hit. We can do it. Let's, let's make this into something. And they just didn't like it. They just didn't get it. It didn't fit. And I couldn't open my mind enough to sort of like let it grow and let it change because I'd been so glued to it. So that song sat on a shelf for a decade. Um, Of course, when we got back into the writing process this last year, I'm never going to let it go. So I brought it up again. (laughs) And I'm like, guys, what about this song? Maybe we could like do it in a new way, like have a new idea about it. And they came at it in this completely heavy way that was just so different, but I was in a different place and my mind was open and I just let it go. And it became something so much cooler, so much bigger than it was. And it actually led me to change some of the lyrics from being more self-deprecating into being more empowered, oh, that's beautiful. which is a big thing about this album is this just this empowerment that is um, emerging from us. So when has something that you didn't plan on surprised you? Ice. When I first got signed, the music was so new, there was no one that could help us. And uh, I signed to Sire Records, Seymour Stein, who signed Madonna, Talking Heads. And i never been um, A&R'd before because no one knew the genre well enough to A&R us. 
And mm-hmm. we were successful. We had six consecutive gold and platinum records with no A and R. Now all of a sudden everybody understands hip hop and now you got these new people that want to come and get involved with your music. Every time the A and R come in and they say the record could be a little bit better, I'm now willing to listen to it. And mm. usually we go back in, we work on it, and it does get better. As much as I hate hearing them tell me that, <laughs> mm-hmm. I used to be like, nah, nah, I'm not doing it. But now I turn it back in and we make the record better. So I res- I got to respect that. It's good to be pushed. Mm-hmm. It's good to be pushed. But I will say they picked the wrong records. I tell them this record's a banger. They go, I don't know. And it always is. So I'm still the best <laughs> A&R for my yes. music. Well, you know your fans too. You know what you are. You made it. Thank you. And and, yeah. and then when I collab, I have to collab with people I really respect. Like I respect you. So whatever you, you put on that record is what we use because you're an expert. When I work with Slayer, I'm good. If I'm working with somebody, Lamb of God, they're experts. So I let I, I, I let it go. Like I've been working with Dr. Dre. I just shut up yeah. when I'm with Dr. Cool. Dre because I respect him enough. So it has a lot to do with if I respect the person I'm collabing with. And, um, I really try not to collab with people I don't respect. That's the key. That's the key. Don't work with people that you don't respect. I mean, period. That should just be a, a done That's thing. That's it. I love that. Can you tell us what you're working on with Dre? I've been with Dre for years. I've been knowing Dre for, for, since he started. And he's just been begging me, Ice, let me produce you. Let me produce you. Now, Dre <laughs> wants to get in and correct the way you rap and everything. He he micromanages you so uh over the summer i'm gonna go out there i've been sending records back and forth but like we were saying snoop just sent me a record we listen to each other's records like Mm -hmm. we have our group of people we respect Mm -hmm. and we send it to them and say what you think what do you think what do you think so we kind of in hip-hop or in my world as artists, we A and R each other. Right. You know, like I'll send a song over to Snoop, and Snoop will say, "Yo, you need to put this right here or change this. Would be harder, cuz." And I'll be like, "Yeah, that, yeah, yeah." We do that too. Yeah. Me and Ollie were doing that a little yeah. bit. We do that yeah. in the rock world. It's like I want to know what my friends think because you want to know what your Absolutely. fans think. You want to know what people who get you, who know you, think. Here's funny thing: Dre does. Dre will have you in the studio, and he'll put up some music he knows sucks. <laughs> just, to, just to test just, you. Just to see w- the people in the room who's bobbing their head. And he's mm. like, okay, y'all invalid. <laughs> you're invalid. You're Amazing. invalid. He wants somebody <laughs> that'll say, what are you playing, man? That's some garbage. And he goes, all right, I love you, Ice. Amazing. I love you. <laughs> I love it. So good. Aurora? I really understand what you mean about being very protective in the beginning uh, because when you're an artist, you. You have many people meaning a lot of things about you and your music. You have to kind of start out in life being like a wolf mother or something, like being very protective of your own art and your own heart, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I really understand what you said about um, with time, when you have to fight less for these small things, you can actually let people in and allow people to help you. And that can be the greatest gift ever. And also, I can notice that the way I write have changed a lot because I've learned to write about things after they've happened. Because often before, when I was younger, I loved to write about sadness when I was sad. And the songs kind of turned out way more destructive and just depressing than they are now. Because Interesting. Now I know that I need to include a little light in my songs because... I want my songs to talk to people. Absolutely. I feel like I've learned through my life to write with more perspective and emotion. We have a lot in common. It makes so much sense. Ali. For me, the biggest thing with writing music is ego. It's obviously there's no magic button that you can press just to like completely remove your ego. Because if if there was, it'd be great because you'd be able to listen to your music as a person with no investment or stock in, in that song. Do you know what I mean? But obviously when... You're involved in the process when it's your music, when it's your baby. It's just like, there's just so many triggers, you know what I mean? Someone can say something about that song and then you react to it, you know. As if it's you. Yeah. It's not just like you going like, I think I'm awesome, no one can tell me what to do. It's also like telling yourself you can't do things. Right. 
when I first started singing, for instance, on our, our music and, you know, we got producers and stuff and we could just feel that it wasn't working with the producer we chose, but it was like, but I can't do this alone. Like, I don't know how to do this. And the, the fact of the matter was that we did know how to do it, but we just needed to stop depending on other people and do our own thing. Now it's like we've, we've done our last three albums just on our own, produced them fully, you know, by ourselves and all that stuff and now it's like just starting to let people back in to collaborate with it's like yeah allowing that to happen again you know what i mean because it's like we've been stung before and you know our ego might be saying we can do it all on our own why do we need anyone else but you you get so used to writing music in a way that it's still like the same and if you bring someone in they just like maybe express something completely different and you would just never have done that and, and then you would have never gone down that path and you would have never learned that right. way to be creative and well it's interesting because i i really have found that like having a more open heart, like Aurora was saying, with with the people that you have that that trust with, when they find that magic thing, sometimes that is the actual thing that'll help you actually be your best. For some reason, if someone else has done it, I get more excited about it. Yeah, I, I totally. guess because because then your your ego is gone. So then like, you're taken out of it. Yeah. For instance, we started working with a producer like just to experiment last week, and he, he gave me like a little loop, and and it was some lyrics already there in a melody, and I was like. I kind of broke apart the the lyrics, just spun them all t- to my way. But I was like, I would have never wrote the words that are there. I would have never wrote them myself, but they mean so much to me now. Like I've just found the meaning. I found a way to work. I them. felt like that about your song. <laughs> you let me sing. I was like, I never would have written these words. And they're so beautiful because of that. I don't even have to question it. It's like, it's already this beautiful song that's always existed. You know, I just get to come into it. When you were like, oh, I'm going to change all these lyrics because this just kind of doesn't make sense. And this is a bit corny. I was like, no, this all makes perfect sense to me for these for these reasons. <laughs> My lyrics, yeah. As soon as I write one line, it's like, wait, no, this isn't good enough. Yeah, yeah, it's it's strange. All I had to do was sort of ice the cake, and it felt beautiful, and it was kind of feeding this other emotion, this other part that needed to come out of me that couldn't come out at that time. Last year, I was working just nonstop, especially at the end of the year, just slamming my head against the wall, trying to get these last lyrics to come out of myself and finish our album. And uh, of course, right in the middle of that whirlwind was when Bring Me the Horizon reached out and said, hey, we've got this track that we were thinking maybe it'd be cool if if you wanted to to contribute. I just knew that I needed to follow my heart and put what I was doing to the side for a moment. And it was a really, really positive thing for me. And I recorded it here in my house and went back and forth with Ollie every day, just sharing ideas and tweaking and then sending parts. By the end of the week, it was finished. And to be able to have finished something, you know, instead of being stuck in the weeds for months at a time trying to work on something else, our ballad that is a beautiful part of our album now, it's called Far From Heaven. You're listening to the BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. I'm Amy Lee of Evanescence, joined by rapper, songwriter, and producer Ice-T, Bring Me the Horizon vocalist Ollie Sykes, and singer, songwriter, and producer Aurora. Music really, in a big way, is, is a therapy for me. I use it to process what's going on that I'm not maybe facing myself. And it's actually, I, I have learned things about myself through writing a song and then like listening back and being like, whoa, I guess I have to deal with this. I lost my brother uh, just a few years ago and the grief of that, just processing the loss, a big part of my identity is being his big sister kind of had to like rethink who am I now? And some of that has been a big catalyst for the writing so much music coming out of me in the past few years. And just my inspiration has really come through loss and grief and through the writing, I really learned in this last year, year and a half, that it's not all about the pain and the loss and the sadness. It's about stuff in me that is strong enough to pick myself up and want to fight after after the worst thing happens, after the bottom falls out, that um, through hearing myself back, being like, whoa, I am strong enough. And that's incredible. And that makes me feel empowered in itself. And the whole album kind of wrapping up in in that way that was more about getting back up than the falling down uh, has been really beautiful in my life as a realization in, in this in this time that has been so hard, you know, in the world, you know, for so many, many, many reasons. Aurora, how about you? Um, personal growth, like how do you how do you grow inside your music? Well, first of all, I'm so sorry for your loss. That is such a strong story, and it's very moving. And 
I've never really written about myself much in my life. Of course, if I ever experience something like that, uh, like you have, Amy, then I'll probably have a big need to write much more personally. But in my life so far, I've, I've written mostly about the world and about people around me. But I guess you take that personal too. I think every song I've ever written is affected by something I see people out there go through. Uh, Runaway, I wrote when I was 11. So that's a very old song. I remember seeing for the first time that people tend to lie about being well. That when you say, are you okay? And often grown-ups I was noticing were saying that, no, you know, they're fine. But you can see in their eyes that they're not. And it really confused me that people would describe their mental health at the moment with a lie. <laughs> and that's what inspired Runaway, the feeling that people tend to be so lost so often. And it's hard for us to, to just be human sometimes. Being human is really an extreme sport. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ollie? How do you use music in that way? How does it play a role in your personal growth? The second time I went to rehab, I was so against doing the 12 steps, the 12 step program, whatever you call it. Like, just because the first thing was like about God, like you have to hand over to God and all that. Like, if I do this for God, I'm going to end up just failing because I don't believe in a God, not a conscious kind of personified God or whatever. And also I was like, and I don't want to air my dirty laundry with like a bunch of strangers. Like, I don't want to tell them all this stuff. I've just gone through what I'm going through, all this stuff. And the person like helping me through it was like, you really should though. And all this stuff. And I was like, no, and I was just refused basically. And he was like, all right, but you need to talk and maybe you need to write a letter or, you know, maybe I like, write a letter for who. And they were like, it doesn't have to be for anyone. You know, it's just, you know, you write it, you get it out and all this stuff. And I was like, that's stupid. Like you can't help me with these problems. Like why do I want to write it down? Who am I writing to? And all this stuff. And I started writing lyrics while I was in rehab. And I started, like, you know, writing everything I'd been through, getting it all out. And before that, I'd never, you know, stuff had been personal, but it had just been not really conscious, where this was, like, conscious, like, I'm actually just getting everything that's on my chest and in my head out onto paper. And, like, it was then I realized how cathartic it is, do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it's like, I mean, I implore anyone, like, when people ask me how, you know, if you're depressed, like, what to do, it's like, talk, talk or write it down or whatever, and it's like, I'm glad that I almost like tricked myself into doing that homework <laughs> because like a lot of the time we all know what we need to do to make ourselves better, but we never do it. Do you know what I mean? We just don't. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful that my job means I have to do this. I have to write it all down because it's like, not only do you get it all come out, but then somewhere down the line, you have like an arena or a show of like five, 10,000 people all screaming these words back at you. It's just like the most, Amazing. Inc the most incredible thing. So like, same way our last record it's like I didn't realize how much stuff I hadn't actually dealt with until I allowed myself to go there it's cool ice there was a point when I realized that no matter what I'm thinking there's millions of people thinking the exact same way if I'm mad there's a million people mad we don't have one emotion that no one else has yes. and like if you get in trouble they put you in a group of people with the same problem and what makes you go into a hole is when you think I'm the only person yes. going through this yes. at this moment. 100%. You know, my girl did me wrong. Well, let me put you in a room with a bunch of guys and everybody had the same problem. And it makes you feel like, okay, I can deal with this. So what I do is I get ideas during life. So my new record's called Love is Fake, The Hate is Real. I heard my boy say that. Like, I was listening. My buddy said, hey, yo, man, you know, love is fake. They hate it. I said, man, that's a song. You know, so my brain is like, that right there, what you just said, that's a song. The song we did, Amy, came from me losing a friend and watching the outpour of love happen. I'm talking about Nipsey Hussle. He stole out the um, Staples Center for a tribute like he was dead right. in two hours. But he couldn't have sold that out if he was alive. Mm. And I'm like, when people die, DMX just died. It's this outpouring of love. But where where was everybody while you were alive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
You know, that's when I wrote When I'm Gone. You know, don't wait till I'm gone to tell people how great a guy I was. And don't wait till your friends pass away. Show them the love right now. And uh, I, I think the self-growth is just knowing that as I'm making this song, I know I'm reaching a lot of people in the same place with me. I'm kind of singing for them, too. That's a powerful thing. Hmm. Yeah. And Amy, the way you connected with my song was because you said, hey, my brother, I just went through it. Mm -hmm. So I tell people when we do interviews, I say we were both singing from the heart. Yeah. So I was on tour at the time and a friend of a friend, someone on my crew mentioned that Body Count were looking for some cool collaborations on their Carnivore album and uh, that they had mentioned me. And I immediately said I was really interested in that and wanted to hear what the song was. And uh, I immediately had an idea. The lyrics in particular really spoke to me. Um, I actually kind of was late to the party. I think that originally it was like, sorry, we don't have time because I needed to get back from tour first to submit it. Even though they said it's too late, I'm just going to throw this down anyway and send it to them and see what they think. And I sent it and I said, hey, I know <laughs> I know we're out of time, but I just wanted you guys to see what what I would have done, basically, if if I got in the gig. So, you know, call me next time. And then they called back and went, OK, you know, just kidding. We do have time. This is awesome. So we got the song. <laughs> I, I, it was an emotion you had and it just happened to work. Yeah. I didn't know about your brother. You, you know, it, 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 but it's, it's a, you know, we all go, we all go through the same thing. Absolutely. Things. Everybody it's does. amazing how connected <laughs> we really all are when you really break it down yes. mm -hmm. and being able to use what we do to connect people, I think is the greatest thing that we can do. Well, that's like when my man said, when you sing it and then the people yell it back at you, mm. you're singing a song and you're like, oh my God, everybody is connecting to what I wrote. And that's a beautiful feeling, you know, that that's a great thing. Makes me want to get back on tour right now. Yeah. I want to be back <laughs> on stage. I need to feel those voices, please. Thanks so much to our guests this week, Ice-T, Ollie Sykes, and Aurora. And thanks to you for listening. I'm Amy Lee. Head to the website for more Music Life shows, bbcworldservice.com forward slash music life. It's such an honor talking to all of you. It's amazing to hear everything you have to say because we're just so similar. I mean, I just connect <laughs> so many things that everybody had to say. <laughs> I hope we get to do something like this again. Guys, what do you have coming up? What's next for you? Ice. Yeah, everybody out there, uh, follow me on Twitter at Final Level or on IG, and you will definitely need to wear a helmet on those sites. <laughs> <laughs> Aurora. Aurora, how about you? I'm working on some very exciting stuff, and you may like it and you may not, but a lot of exciting things are coming this year. Um, I hope you stay safe and drink water and call your grandmothers and grandfathers. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it's it. It's important, so though. Cute. It is, it is. <laughs> so sweet <laughs> Ollie yeah we're doing like four EPs this year well this year maybe a bit next year as well called Post Human four including survival horror so you can look forward to them I guess <laughs> you guys rock thanks so much for taking the time this was fun yeah it was peace bye 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 bye, bye. 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 bye Aurora bye thanks a lot nice one there's another Music Life podcast coming your way same time next week and here's a quick look at what you can expect I'm singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist Billy Nomates, and I'll be your host on next week's episode of Music Life from the BBC World Service. I'll be joined by primal screen bassist Simone Marie Butler, singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist Senia Rubinos, and Lancome vocalist Rady Pete. We'll see you next time.